Hello again. I'm uh, Rutika Nitsu. I'm uh, president of the association SOS uh, Myeloma uh, from Romania, an association of uh, Romanian myeloma patients. And uh, uh, I am here to introduce uh, uh, today Ananda Plante and uh, Plate, sorry, and uh, Tamas uh, Beretki. Uh, who will uh, uh, introduce us uh, uh, in a session uh, where they will be talking about the patient advocate uh, development strategies and how an umbrella organization can help you. Um, as far as Ananda is concerned, you already know she is the CEO of uh, MPE, and uh, she will explain us a little bit more about the advocate program developed by MPE. And uh, Tamas is uh, currently working uh, as the communication advisor of the European AIDS Treatment Group, uh, the largest European network of individuals uh, living with HIV. And also he is an author at UPATI, the European Patient Academy on Therapeutic Innovation. Uh, allow me to tell you that uh, Tamas is uh, set to defend uh, his PhD based on research into the significance and the perspective of patient organization in Europe late 2016. Uh, he firmly believes that by educating people about their d disease and making them more aware of their health, uh, they will become able to back up their rights with knowledge and thereby they can make a true impact. And I would say, us, the myeloma patients, we couldn't agree more with that. <laughs> so <laughs> this being said, uh, allow me to invite uh, Ananda to, to start the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Lucica, for that kind introduction. So today I'll be talking a bit around the patient advocate, uh, the advocate development program that MPE has developed and the reasons behind why we decided to, to do this. This is something that we talked about yesterday already, that um, there are different roles in patient advocacy, there are different levels of patient advocacy. You have patient advocacy at a support level and information level where you support the individual patient very closely. Um, you see them uh, e nearly every day. You have very um, small groups of patients even coming into, into the organization to, to get information from you firsthand. <clears throat> you have advocate level who are active at a health policy level where you fight and advocate for better and patient-centric regulations and laws, and also for better access to treatment. And there is a third layer, which is about enhancing research, where uh, patient advocates collaborate internationally with clinicians and industry, and you also help defining priorities and conduct. However, independently of the role that you as a patient advocate choose to have, uh, um, what is clear and that's something that we've also discussed over the weekend is that we all have the same objective in terms of getting the best possible care to the patient at the right moment in time. Um, that is independent of the role we have, of the layers that I showed you before. However, depending on the role in patient advocacy, um, we will do that at different levels and in different ways. So um, for this purpose, um, what is clear is that we need to become involved for stakeholders. So to, to really pursue that objective that we have in common, we need to be involved and, and get in touch with medical societies, we need to be in touch with the regulator and need to, um, to uh, provide our evidence and bring it to the table for discussions. We need to be at the table with HTA bodies that sometimes it's difficult to get the foot into the door. However, we, we need to uh, keep on knocking. Payers and reimbursement authorities, industry, and so on and so forth. There's a whole range of stakeholders we need to involve in. We also need to be involved at different levels. It might be at European level 
national or regional level, and it is very important for us to know at what level we need to do what in order to you know, save our scarce resources and, uh, and be as effective and efficient as possible. We also do it for different purposes. Um, so we would get involved with industry, for instance, in order to design best, better trials, or you know, we, you would get in touch with medical societies to really um, try to incentivize them to um, join our uh, common objective and try to achieve that together. However, um, what is also clear and uh, becomes clearer the more we get involved with these stakeholders is that patient advocates need specific skills and they also need training. And it is not something that is a one-off thing. You, you train yourself, but it is a constant that goes throughout your whole period as a, as a patient adv advocate um, in the scene. Um, you never stop learning and you never stop improving the ways that you engage with these stakeholders, um, the way you create evidence, the way you try to convince to get them on your side or try to negotiate. Um, you need to train yourself to know the rules that apply to what you do. You need to know the system in order to change it. Um, you need to challenge them and you need to make a difference. So here in the patient advocate development program, um, what we will focus on, whereas you know, yesterday we were focusing on the ATLAS and you know, how, how do we train organizations and advocates on you know, improving access, building strategies for access to treatment in the countries. Um, it, here we go a level up in terms of not only focusing on policy, but really if we have a look at these three layers, <clears throat> it is the layer which tries to improve research, tries to really push for better tr clinical trials, try, tries to push for better outcomes for patients, tries to introduce the patient's needs into the design of clinical trials in order to have a better outcome in the end and also have it in a more timely manner. So what areas have we identified um, where tr um, training is needed for, for the, the community, the myeloma community? Um, so the areas identified are some of them are disease specific. You need to know about the disease, about the biology of the disease, about what drugs you have coming up uh, the pipeline. You need to know what drugs are approved. You also need to know what drugs are reimbursed in your system and so on and so forth. Those are all disease specific ones. You then have cross uh, disease areas that, are, um, that need to be covered as well. Uh, they, they are as important as the other ones. And you need to know them, they're a bit more systematic about you know, the basics of uh, medicines, uh, research, drug development, about statistics that personally bore me to death, but I know that I need them. Um, regulatory approval process, um, around health technology assessment, how reimbursement works, how HTA works at a European level and how what part is national. Um, the attempts of the European Commission to, um, to, to facilitate that at a European level and, and the failures of it. Um, and that comes, to, uh, comes back to the competencies between the EU and the national level. It is really crucial for patient advocates to know not only the content about you know, what you are gonna say, but you need to really, as we mentioned yesterday, avoid barking up the wrong tree. Avoid addressing issues to the wrong stakeholder at the wrong time and bringing evidence to the table that is not relevant for that stakeholder particularly. So this is how the, the, the advocate development program looks like. It's an intensive training program. We have uh, some of the some of the trainees here, <laughs> and um, uh, we we started the pilot this year, and hopefully we only had um, we only had a budget for five trainees, despite getting many more applications. So we we're, we're going to try and um, um, get more 
places available for the next term. So um, this training, um, uh, what it tries to do is to increase the number of, of advocates that know about the topic. All of those topics that we talked about before at the, the previous slide at a, at a European level. It is really important that you, as an advocate, join that program, not only having in mind what is happening in your own country, which is absolutely relevant, but what we also need is advocates who know about this and have in mind what they can do at the European level, because research does not happen at, at a national level, and that we need to keep in, in, in our minds. Um, to join relevant discussions and influence decision making, and that is the aim, um, but that needs to happen by understanding how that drug de development really works and how, how that process fits into the context of the whole system. Um, so that learning is based on uh, an online training, which uh, Tamash is very, um, ha has been kind enough to help us with, and he's doing an amazing job with, with that, um, based on the, on the experience he had at Ilpati. We also have two face-to-face -face, uh, trainings. I'll talk about that um, afterwards. <clears throat> and um, scientific sessions at congresses where um, trainees can implement what they've learned in the theoretical part. And I mean, maybe, maybe this is the point where, where it makes sense to mention, you know, before going into detail of, of the advocate development program, as such, the, the, first, um, the first term of it, is um, we always complain about you know, not having the right clinical trials in place, not having the right crit criteria in place for, for clinical trials uh, to recruit patients, um, not having you know, the focus on, on the right outcomes. All of that is correct. But I think we need to combine that complain modus with something more proactive. And that proactivity doesn't come by itself. You really need to know your stuff in order to sit down with industry and give input into a clinical trial protocol. Because they, you know, you have one shot. If they invite you to an investigator meeting, you do it right the first time or you never get invited again. And maybe if at that point you go in there, you make your case, and they see that that might be useful for them, clinicians and industry at the same time, you might have a chance that they invite you again, and you might have a chance that that protocol in the end will be implemented. And that will be the protocol that will recruit your patients. So it is kind of a responsibility if you think about it, how important it is that we, you know, thoroughly study this. So I don't know whether you see, probably not. <clears throat> We've combined uh, the, the advocate development program um, into three parts. One of it was a capacity building at EHA, the European Hematology Association Annual Congress in June, where we had all hematology um, advocates present. We then had a tailored um, day, afternoon, with our trainees and, uh, and clinicians, experts in the myeloma field, that would talk about the um, advances that were um, presented at EHA <coughs> in myeloma, the pipeline, but also around what is, what is, what is being presented, what, is, what, what are the hot topics. And then we went into also the clinical guidelines for treatment and diagnosis um, to really see how is it that a patient should be you know, treated no matter where, where he or she lives. The third part will take place at ESMO in September, where we will cover less clinical uh, topics. We will go into the, those topics that we were discussing before that are cross disease. Um, and, and hopefully that the idea of doing this with congresses was basically to not only bombard people with theory, but to make sure that you know, once you have the theory, you can actually link that to where science is presented, where it happens. 
you know, to meet, you know, the, the clinicians, go to the poster sessions and have, you know, one of the superstars present to you what he's done in that clinical trial and ask him questions. So that combination we found interesting to, and, and it's something that um, we haven't seen anywhere and, and hopefully it, that will work. I know that at the beginning for some participants it, it was a bit tough because the presentations can be quite technical. But hopefully, you know, throughout the online course and, um, and, and the months that, that are to come, we'll manage to, uh, you know, to, to get the trainees to a level where they can actually go into a scientific session and understand everything and write reports for their organizations and, and so on and so forth. So um, we have a tra training site as well. Uh, you can see it over there. That will be merged into the, the MPE website soon, but, but you'll, you'll get um, information on that uh, further in the year. And, um, and that's basically it. That's the structure. And, and that, um, so the timeline for this, as you can see, starting May 2017, we have all this, what I, what, what, what I just discussed, the online course and the face-to-face -face trainings. I'm not going to go into detail of that. May 2018, we plan to start the course all over again. But we will refrain from keeping the trainees that we had this year out of that program. So whoever feels the need of still being part of the program and continue the learning process will be able to move up a level, a level in their knowledge. And I think that is crucial for us because we cannot you, you, with a one-off, you, you, you can't do it. Um, and in 2019, and this is something that Tamash will be speaking about afterwards, the plan is to hold our first community advisory board. He will explain what that is. But basically, it's around creating, um, creating a platform by which you invite industry to your table and you ask them questions and you try to turn around the tables in order to give input into their clinical development process and their protocols. Um, yeah, basically it's that. And I'm not going to say anything else about CAPS, otherwise <laughs> you won't be. Um, so the last thing I, I, want, to, I want to say is um, that this program is a significant investment for us. So we haven't just done it for fun. It's not you know, that we have spare money and we thought, oh, let's just spend it on this. Um, and it is important to really think about, and not only us, but also yourselves, what the return is for the community. Because we've spent a lot of money on it. Staff, and particularly Ana Vallejo, has spent many, many hours trying to get this working. Um, we have, you know, Tamash dedicated and he's, he's put uh, the soul and strength into the, into the program. We have this website, the training platform. We even got endorsement from EHA for the clinical program, which is wonderful. And, um, and we've engaged several clinicians um, who are very passionate about how we're approaching this. And I think that's quite something. So we've invested a lot in this. And for me, it would be important to know from your side what you think about this and how you think you can help us to, to move this forward. The other thing that is to highlight in this, um, in this slide is that we didn't develop this program to satisf satisfy the curiosity of anyone. This is not a nice to have thing. What we want to create is a real base of knowledge in the myeloma community. We want to create the best, the creme de la creme of knowledgeable advocates in the myeloma field. And we want them to stay. And that is, that is something that we don't have at the moment and something that we need if you think about it. 
So we really, um, we really need your help for that. Um, so who are those advocates? And that is my last, my last slide. We need people who are active in the field of myeloma and related diseases. This is not limited to myeloma, but amyloidosis would be included. We need them living in a European country. Um, we need them to be interested, at least interested, in the third layer we were talking about, myeloma research, not only at a national, but at a European level. We want them to really push for knowledge, not do it as a one-off. We need them to be persistent, to stay there, to continue learning, to wanting to learn more. Um, they need to speak English, which sometimes is, a, is an issue, but it, it's a must, and open to new approaches. And for that, we need your help, because maybe you're just not interested. Maybe you're more interested in policy, or maybe you, know, you don't have time for this. However, in every single organization, I am sure that there is someone interested in science, or someone who might fit these criteria that you could identify and send over to us. Like for instance, Anita did with, uh, with Lara, where she said, well, I have, you know, I have enough to do, but that person, that young lady might be, you know, someone with potential, and actually it is like that. <laughs> So that is what we need, and, um, and I'd be um, super happy to get emails from you um, proposing people applying for the next round. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions. No questions. I scared you all. <laughs> yeah, if you allow me, Ananda, I will uh, encourage you uh, uh, anyone who feels like it to apply for this program because it is really interesting and uh, challenging in the same time and offers a lot of support to uh, to sustain our um, claims towards uh, pharma companies and authorities. So um, Alfonso is telling me, move on. Questions at the end because Tamaj will lose his flight. <laughs> I think that's what he wanted oh, to say. Okay. <laughs> you know, we have telepathy after so many years of working together. <laughs> so, Tamaj. <laughs> Thank you, Ananda. Thank you so much, and hello again. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rush through this because otherwise I literally will lose my flight. Um, so I, I think that um, uh, I mentioned it to all of you during the previous session that I will talk about a practical example on how you can uh, do meaningful work in patient involvement and, and patient advocacy uh, with industry and, and also with other stakeholders. And for this I will use the case study of the European Community Advisory Board on HIV and AIDS. It's actually, um, um, we have expanded our work into um, hepatitis and uh, hep uh, viral hepatitis and tuberculosis as well because HIV, HIV and AIDS, hepatitis and uh, tuberculosis come in a package. So these, um, these three illnesses and some me mental conditions as well go together very often. So therefore we cover all of these. Um, but let's see very quickly um, what the European Community Advisory Board is about. Um, it was established in 1997, and it is meant to be a forum of interaction between the communities of people living with HIV um, uh, and also the pharmaceutical industry. Originally, um, as you probably have um, similar bodies in, uh, in your uh, disease area, originally there were um, community advisory boards attached to clinical trials or to pharmaceutical companies in the HIV field as well initially. But there was a lot of problems, or there were a lot of problems with these community advisory boards at the time, um, uh, because it was very difficult to access treatment. So oftentimes clinical trials were used as vehicles to access treatment, which immediately also created a certain inequality within the community. Some people who became members of, of, of advisory boards 
found easier access to, uh, to medication and to, uh, through the clinical trials in which they were involved. So there was immediately an element of corruption in this whole uh, thing. And also, uh, well, this was um, 20 um, uh, years ago. It was a very um, new thing to work with patients for industry. Therefore, they were also super cautious and uh, terrified that they would do something wrong. And also it was a very new concept at all that you would want to work with patient representatives. Why would you want to do that? So um, what happened, uh, actually it was, there was a very specific moment when one of the pharmaceutical companies came to a meeting um, uh, with, uh, with the patient representatives and they came with bodyguards. They came to this meeting with bodyguards, so there were, there were the, the pharmaceutical industry representatives sitting on one side with four armed guys. And on the other side of the table, there were like six guys with AIDS, emaciated, like really thin, ill, dying. And that immediately went into the press, understandably. So the pharmaceutical industry said that they wanted to protect the patients that's why they came with that's why they came with bodyguards but obviously they wanted to protect themselves because the aids movement was was so angry and strong at the time so this momentum this this very important moment was then used and understood by the pharmaceutical industry and they set down all the companies who were involved at the time in HIV research, they sat down with the European AIDS Treatment Group, which is my home organization, and with an American fellow uh, partner organization, and they established the European Community Advisory Board. So here this, this was a joint initiative by the industry and the patient community. So it's not unheard of that you work together with the industry in this format. It is, right now, the European Community Advisory Board is a working group, is part, is an integrated part of the European AIDS Treatment Group, which is a network of individuals living with HIV. We work in various fields. We work in science, which is ECAB, the European Community Advisory Board, but we also work in policy, and for this we have a political working group, and we also do a lot of training. So we also have a separate uh, working group which only does organizes um, uh, training events. At the end of uh, 2016, we had um, 112 members uh, from approximately 38 countries. So there's a bit of coming and going. Uh, Europe for us is WHO Europe. So this includes Central Asia and it extends uh, to in, into um, uh, the stands into Central Asia. I will not uh, talk a lot about this because I showed you this diagram at the previous sessions. Uh, but this is actually what we say. This is, this is where ECAP plays a role. This is where innovation comes about. This is where knowledge is produced. So we believe we understand ECAB as a vehicle of, of, of knowledge production, where we provide a neutral space where um, uh, participants from all these uh, four stakeholders um, can sit together and can um, uh, work in order to achieve innovation in, in, uh, in uh, biomedical science. Now, there are different models to, uh, to how community advisory boards can work. So these can be therapeutic area specific, like, um, uh, like ours in, in HIV or in CML. And the CML community advisory board was uh, set up just recently, um, less than a year ago. Um, and also there is work ongoing in other disease areas um, like skin cancer, for example, where similar movements are starting in order to set up such um, uh, a community advis advisory board. There can also be advisory boards set up within research institutions, so that's also not unheard of, or specific attached to a single trial. And also there can be community advisory boards that are industry initiated. Now. The, the European Community Advisory Board tries to cover all of these areas. So we are 
we, we, we look at all the different uh, uh, clinical trials ongoing in, uh, in HIV, viral hepatitis, and tuberculosis, and we work with all the companies who are involved in this area, be that diagnostics or um, uh, even generic manufacturers. We work with everyone, we approach everyone, and we invite them to meetings in order to make sure that, that we keep our community is informed, and we also provide this service to the companies. It's a very important perspective or aspect. It's a service to the companies, and I will tell you why this is important. So, as I said, the, uh, the, the European Community Advisory Board is part of the European AIDS Treatment Group, which means that we are also it is also integrated into the budget of the EATG. So it's just one chapter in uh, the patient organization's budget. It's not a separate entity. Um, also, pharmaceutical companies contribute to the funding of, uh, of ECABs um, through various uh, channels. First of all, we get uh, unrestricted research grants. Unrestricted research grants are what it says. These are lump sums of money that the pharmaceutical companies give to the patient organization for them to, to allow them to carry out their work without any limitation or any requests or any, any red tape or tags attached to what we are supposed to do with this money. So those are unrestricted research grants, and in fact, we do research from this money. Um, also, and this is extremely important, pharmaceutical companies pay to attend meetings. Now, of course, the, the question comes up, why would you pay to attend a meeting where you get criticized? But in fact, it's not how we frame it. It's not about getting criticized. It's about getting advice from the patient's perspective. What we do, is we provide input into the pharmaceutical company's research work from the patient's perspective. How can you do that? You can do that if you're educated. If you're educated about your own illness, if you're educated about the political area and, and, and the um, environment, if you understand what's going on in your body, what's going on in what we call the body positive, so in the entire community of people living with HIV. So if you have a full knowledge of that, if you are an expert patient, then the company will be ready to pay for the services that you provide. So that's why we charge for attending these meetings, and the money that we get, we reinvest into educating our members and teaching them about HIV and teaching them about policy. So, and also, we get money through sponsoring of specific projects like uh, conferences, information campaigns, leaflets, brochures, websites, training events. Um, also, because there's, a, there's this rigorous ban on direct-to-consumer marketing uh, in, the, in the European Union, we, get a, we, we used to get a lot of criticism, even from the European Union, because we accept money from the pharmaceutical industry. But in fact, if you can prove that the output, so what you spend the money on, is actually in the public interest, it is for the betterment of science and research and the health of the community, then the European Union approves that you are an independent NGO and, and a civil society organization, which is happening to the ATG consistently for the last 20 years. We have never had any issues because of receiving funding from the pharmaceutical industry. We are still a partner to the, to, to the European Union. So it is, what, where we say our arguments are that this is a rigorously scientific interaction. We talk about science. We never talk about marketing. We even stop marketing presentations and send companies out of the room if they come with marketing presentations. We talk about science because that's why we are there. Um, these meetings are confidential, so even if we take minutes, these minutes are not shared beyond uh, the, the participants. Um, it's a targeted information exchange. Um, also, it's on the highest possible level, so it's not the marketing and not the PR people who come, but medical leads, research leads, G lead investigators um, uh, who, fr from, the, from the various companies who will come to these meetings and will uh, uh, talk to us, and we will look at their data often before the official presentation or publication of the data. And also, it's outside the usual scope of interaction. So it's not 
what pharmaceutical companies usually do. It is in this case, they come to an organization, into, to a patient organization, where they pay for an advisory service. So it's outside the, reg the regular uh, uh, scope of activity. So therefore, it's accepted that it's not marketing, and it really isn't marketing. Because uh, that's not, I can, I can, I mean, I can read the advertisements on the internet. I don't need to travel to Brussels for, to a meeting for that. So, um, nevertheless, of course, we also do a lot of work to diversify our funding. And it's not only pharmaceutical company funding that we receive, but we also um, uh, source funding from European Union projects and, um, and uh, foundations and other sources that we, can do, that, that we can find. So what do we do? What do community advisory boards do? Well, uh, first of all, we have an, a, an involvement in ethics, which means that our members who are expert patients and educated in their, um, in, in their uh, illnesses or, or conditions and also about ethics, um, they sit in um, uh, ethics boards and uh, data safety monitoring boards as patient representatives. I don't know about your countries, but in Hungary, for example, it's quite common that in ethics boards we have a priest who is a civil society representative. Why we say, no way. We don't need, need, don't need priests, pastors, or rabbis in ethics boards, but we need patients. And we provide these expert patients who understand science and who understand ethics. Also, we are involved in research priorities, so we, we can tell the companies what is it that our community needs. What is it that the body positive, that people living with HIV or at threat from HIV need? What is it where you have to do some more work? Um, also, study procedures, we review protocols, uh, uh, Almost all protocols currently implemented in HIV research are previously reviewed by the, in, in Europe, are previously review, reviewed by the European Community Advisory Board before implementation, not afterwards, but before implementation. This is also extremely important. And then we can make an input into the protocol. And we also certainly work in information um, uh, dissemination. We also do a lot of policy work, so we uh, try to intervene in, uh, in, in pricing and also in post-marketing surveillance. Um, how do these meetings, or how are these meetings conducted? It's usually over weekends. We, I mean, ECAB members don't get paid for their participation. The money goes to the organization. You do this as a volunteer. It's usually over the weekend. All your meals and your travel is covered, but you get nothing else than that. Um, uh, it's divided into five units. Each of them is um, uh, three and a half hours. And then companies can buy units. So they pay for one or two units. Two units would be a whole day. Um, and, um, and also, as I already mentioned, it's strictly confidential. And then usually we, we stay for Sunday morning and we take care of internal business. You know, taking decisions, talking about procedures, whatever. There's always... I mean, it's, it's a large organization, so there's always something that needs to be done. Uh, and we also have a scientific officer sitting in Brussels, one of my colleagues, who's a full-time employee, uh, and he does nothing else but takes care of HIV, viral hepatitis, and tuberculosis-related science. So he monitors, um, uh, he's a biologist, has a PhD, and he monitors what's going on in the field, follows up with companies, keeps the membership informed, organizes the meetings. Um, what we have achieved so far, well, we have, of course, it's been going on for 20 years, so there's a huge amount of things that we've done already. First of all, keeping this dialogue going has been a very important point. Um, also, we could achieve a number of, uh, of important amendments to protocols um, in order to serve the interests of the patients better. We could, for example, lower the, 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 the limit of CD4 uh, cell counts, you know. So we said that... Um, um, you shouldn't wait so long, or you shouldn't start um, or, or exclude rather patients from the clinical trial just because their uh, CD4 count, their immune system is not uh, in the shape that the original trial protocol um, uh, foresee, foresaw. Um, also, we, we maintain a full table of access difficulties and issues across Europe with all the, the, the pharmaceutical companies. Is it registered? Is it reimbursed? Is it available? It's these three things are not the same. So um, even if it is on the market, maybe it's not prescribed. So we also monitor that uh, and try to find out what the reasons are. 
Um, I already mentioned the DSMB participation. Um, and also we have several members who sit in various commissions uh, of the EMA. Um, yes, we also work with WHO Europe. For example, the HIV guidelines of WHO Europe are usually developed uh, as a joint effort with ECAB and the ATG. But of course, it's not all roses. So we also have a number of challenges here. First of all, are we representative enough? It's always a question. Can we always effectively reach out to all the groups who are affected by HIV? You know, HIV advocacy tends to be white, gay, middle-class men like myself. But, if, but HIV affects sex workers, it affects black people disproportionately, it also affects transgender uh, people um, uh, and injecting drug users. So these are disadvantaged communities that are difficult to reach. So we, it's, it takes a lot of effort to include them in our work. Um, and this also leads to um, a number of conflicts within the organization which need to be, which need to be managed. Um, also, maintaining our independence is something that we have to do on a consistent basis. It's not, it's not enough to do it once, but you always have to follow up with your members that everybody remains at arm's length from industry and from all the other stakeholders. And of course, sustainability has always been an issue, but so far, so good. So there's a couple of ground rules that I will not go into much detail with. For example, we never quarrel in front of any company or, or anyone who's there. We also never applaud companies because, I mean, why do you clap if someone presents their science? It's not, you know, it, we're not there to celebrate. Um, also, we don't complain too much because that's not interesting. Everybody knows that there are problems, so it's not that's not why we are there. We are there to follow up on, on, on scientific advancement. Um, and then it's, it's, it's your time and you invest your volunteer. It's, you do this in your free time. So if it's useless, you stop it. That's what I said. If it's a marketing exercise, then we just send the company home. And you provide a service, so you should always remain humble. It's, of course, you make claims, but you don't really quarrel with the companies because you, I mean, you are there because they, they pay you for a service. Um, this I will uh, spring over. And also, we do a number of other activities that are there to promote science, such as a journal club. Um, we organize structured readings of, uh, of scientific papers. We also co consistently ask for unpublished data and negative results. You know, if everybody is so incredibly successful in science, then why is progress so slow? And the reason is because you don't get the negative results because of publication bias. So we ask for the negative results because they are there. You just don't see them. Um, and we always ask everything and anything. It's a ground rule. Always ask. There's no wrong question. And we allow time for complaints from the company and from our members, and we try to reflect on them. And we do science and policy together because we believe that, as Ananda said, that you can only remain credible in policy work. You can only influence political decisions or policy decisions if you know what you're talking about. Then you are credible. So for that, you need to get your science right. And that's what we focus on. That's why we educate our members. Uh, consistently. And, and we try to understand how this becomes more than just 20 people together in a room. So we try to act as a group and maintain this cohesion within the group. And you can read more about this uh, in my paper, which is on the internet, free, free, free access. Read the paper, because my dissertation is so long and boring, but the paper is short and, and understandable. Thank you very much. I would be happy to, to, to answer your questions, but I can't because I don't have time. So you can reach me on, on, on my email address. And then I'm happy to answer any questions seriously. Bye now. It was good to have you here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. OK, so uh, we go back to the session presented by Ananda. If uh, there are any questions, please, for Ananda. Yes, please. Uh, can you have a microphone over here, please? I have a question. Uh, when did you start this? Actually, 
sure, maybe I'm not uh, well informed. Uh, when did you start this uh, program, patient advocate, advocate development strategies? Uh, um, um, investment is uh, 50,000 50, euros. And up to now, are you happy what you have achieved? And for how long this program will go on? And what is your final plan or target? Is that okay? So, yeah. So, th this is the first year we're doing it. And we just had the first face-to-face -face meeting two weeks ago at uh, the European Hematology Association uh, in Madrid also. Um, so we can't really say whether we have been successful or not because we just started in May 2017 with the program. Um, we have, I think, a pretty good platform by now with quite some information on it. Um, and the online tool, we have the tutor. So I think from that side, from the you know infrastructure side, I think it has been successful. But the outcomes you don't know until you know at least you have finished the first course, which will be in December this year. Um, I think in one course, as I said, you you also don't expect any miracles. But my hope is that the trainees that are enrolled at the moment will keep coming back to the program, will stick to it. And, and that, you know, along the years, we can build a, a knowledge base that is really solid. If it works, and if we see that, you know, we have people that are committed to continue learning, the idea is to create the ECAPS, to have that kind of forum together with industry by 2019. For that, we need knowledgeable patient advocates. Uh, otherwise, industry won't be interested in that. Um, and uh, and if we see that you know it's fruitful, that people really move up a level in knowledge, then the program will be a, a permanent one. And um, and hopefully, you know, we can expand that to to anyone you know who's uh, successful in the application. Um, yeah, and. I don't know, hopefully, you know, once you, once you move over, you have the platform, maybe a reduction in cost, in cost is also something, something realistic. But for now, we don't know. It's a bit of an experiment, because we know that um, in the HIV community, they already have been doing this for many years, so they have reached that knowledge level, but they continue learning. So you do these things, but you are only entitled of going to the CAPS if you also agree to joining the training, even if you've been in advocacy for 15 years. So. Yeah, at the moment it's five persons. I have to say, if we manage to have, you know, a handful of people that can do this, I would be super happy. That would be amazing. Yeah. But the hope is that next year we can open it up for more. Yeah. Kind of pilot program. <laughs> Is that to encourage national uh, organization or to um, make stronger MPE? I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> no, I'm just trying you know, to catch the point. It's, so it's around building knowledge in the myeloma community. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's not around national organizations or MPE at all. It's... Yeah, it's around moving up a level, the discussion we're having at the moment with industry and with other stakeholders to really get to the point where you're taken seriously and can have that, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, same level discussions with these stakeholders in order to really make a difference. <laughs> yeah. 
Tamash is the trainer of, of the uh, advocate development program and, um, and he's doing that very well. I, but yeah, it's not around organizations, it's around the community, you know, leveling up the knowledge within the community. Any more questions? Yeah, any more questions? Yes, Lisa? please. Oh. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment. So I think it's a good uh, investment for the future. And uh, if we want to uh, get into a situation that patients and patients advocates can put their interests, how uh, uh, industries and uh, maybe also clinics uh, have to work with patients, it will be a fantastic uh, situation. So I think uh, it's good investment money. Thank you. And, and I mean, the knowledge, it, the need for that knowledge is not only at a European level, it's also within the, the countries, uh, because there you have the same discussions. Even though research is a European matter, it's not a national matter, the discussions you have with affiliates of industry in the countries are exactly the same. And when you go to HTA bodies, it's the same. When you go to the regulator or you, you, know, you try to convince your ministry, it's the same. It's around you know, having that level where people take you seriously. Actually, not only take you seriously, but have the need of involving you. you know, they see a benefit. At the moment, it's us trying to convince them to involve us. And we want, it, we want them to want us and need us. Yeah, thank you. I think we have another question over yeah. there. I'm not sure if, the, if it will be a question. Um, as I was sitting in Tamash workshop, he was talking that uh, we need to make a structure of something that we have to offer. And as I see it, maybe mostly from my point of view, we should be the voice of our patients and as you were presenting the points that we can actually get learned, it came to me like we should become informed about what, uh, what the, the industry is doing and study actually their job and become like that we understand them. And I just want to offer or maybe in my opinion it's also important to really be the voice of a patient. Like, as a patient, I have different health problems, but as a patient, I don't care about the name of my treatment, about the name of the medicine. I care about being healthy and feeling good, having, having I will say it, having full quality of life. So maybe that's the voice of a patient. That's, I, I mean, as a patient, I don't see my point at becoming a doctor or a scientist. I see my point at becoming healthy. Yeah. So it's just like the idea about, I, I know that this quality of life is something we cannot touch. We can touch the medicine, but we cannot touch the quality of life. But just something we need to bring. So yeah, so, here. so it's good that you raise that. So you, you're here as a patient advocate, not as a patient. I know that sometimes is difficult to but you're not here for yourself. You're here for the community you represent at home. And yeah, yeah. Let me just finish my point. So that, that's one thing that often, you know, is forgotten when, when we get even invited by industry. In order to represent that community, it is good to have an idea what, you know, the patients you're in touch with think and so on. However, having hardcore evidence that demonstrates what the needs of your patients are, that is the key. It's not around saying, I think that quality of life is good or not. Let's do a questionnaire. Let's get a thousand responses and let's bring that to industry and say, there you have the response. That's the answer. Because that is what moves and shifts and changes protocols, 
not the fact that one of us is sitting somewhere in an advisory board over and over again. One day it's in company A, the next day it's in company B, because we talk about the same things and we've been doing it for many years, but nothing changes. So it's really time for us to do that step and say, yes, I am a patient, because I am a patient too, but I'm standing here now representing the myeloma community. And what I want to bring is not an anecdote of you know, something that I heard or what I heard at the discussions with my patients. It's evidence, hardcore evidence that you will not be able to ignore. That's, I don't know whether that clarifies. Okay. I don't see here uh, what, for instance, patient in Bosnia will have from this, if you can explain that, how it will influence their life, their... Okay, I'll give you a yeah. practical example. Maybe it's the easiest one. Are there any clinical trials in Bosnia? I don't know. I know that they are, they are in terrible situation. We are trying to help them. Mm -hmm. We are trying to help them. Okay. So So, yeah. So, what is benefit for them? Like my my example is: Are you aware if there are any clinical trials in Bosnia? No. Well, okay. So I can tell you the most probable. I, I don't know either, but I can most certainly say that probably there is none. Yeah. Why? Why are there no clinical trials in Bosnia? only that there are people that are dying, they have a diagnose, they yeah. even have a good treatment and nothing else. So the reason why there are no clinical trials in Bosnia is because industry is not interested in having clinical trials in Bosnia. It's commercially not interesting. So we and you as a patient advocate here have a duty of finding a way to convince industry to bring clinical trials to Bosnia and not stop and not sleep until that happens. And that is what I do every day. And that is the impact we have in patients. Yeah. 